What's up guys? Welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Rodell and in today's video we got an instructive hippopotamus game played by Tigran Petrosian back in the year of 1983. His opponent, a master level player, Odile Sabatov, started off this game with white, advancing in the center with e4, and we now see the perk defense from the former world champion. This game continued with d4, followed by g6, and fianchettoing that dark square bishop on g7. And now white continues with bishop c4, in which case we see this e6 idea. I personally, whenever playing the hippopotamus defense, love this idea of e6, particularly when bishop c4 is played. And oftentimes I wait to see if white's going to put their bishop on the square before I play e6, because by playing this move, white isn't envisioning simply attacking this pawn on e6, which is obviously very well defended. They're really trying to put pressure on f7, which, by the way, is the weakest pawn in chess because only our king defends it. But now by playing this move e6, we have really limited the activity of this bishop. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's a bad piece, but I've definitely seen better. We see this move of knight f3 from white and now knight e7. And here white continues with bishop g5. I personally don't think that it's really hardly ever in white's best interest to play bishop g5 against the hippo because if white plays this move before we play knight e7 we're not going to freak out and play a move like f6 we're just going to play what we were going to do anyways right and in a position like this following bishop g5 we were going to play this move h6 but now we get it with tempo and now if a move like bishop h4 which is what was played in the game we now have ideas such as g5 followed by knight g6 this is often played anyways but really by playing bishop g5 and bishop h4, white is giving us a bunch of tempo. In this case, we first see this idea of a6, followed by knight d7. And after queen e2, we finally see g5, followed by knight g6. I mean, this knight really attacking some key dark squares, particularly f4, as well as a square of e5. White so far has played pretty classical looking chess, right? Very normal positioning, two pawns in the center, protected by two knights on f3 and c3, a castled king, etc., etc. We as black, on the other hand, have a somewhat odd-looking position. That is, if you've never played or seen the hippopotamus before, played at a high level. Here, white sees the fact that they're simply up in development. I mean, right now, white does have four minor pieces developed, as well as a castled king and this queen on e2. Why not try to break things open? So we see this move of e5 from white, but now from black, we see a surprising shift. We don't see black playing defensive chess here, but actually just going all out on the king side of the board with g4 attacking this knight. Now notice, before this move of g4, white currently had not one, two, or three, but four defenders all on this pawn on e5. But now we're actually forcing one of those defenders to go away. And in so doing, we can now take on e5 and actually win that battle because we currently have three defending pieces, and white only has three attackers. White here could have taken the pawn on e5, and in that case, we simply would have captured back, probably with our d knight, putting some pressure on that bishop on c4, but white here continues with d5, really trying to break this game open, putting some pressure on e6, and obviously we don't want to allow this move of d takes e6, as this pawn would be defended by the bishop on c4. So here we see Petrosian continue by taking off that centralized pawn. And now after knight takes d5, simply castling kingside. I really like this move, getting the king out of the line of fire. We got to start developing our pieces very quickly. And we now see this line of f3 from white. I really quickly want to cover, okay, why didn't white just snatch off this pawn on g4? I mean, at first sight, it seems as if this king on g8 is under a ton of line of fire. But notice here that white's pieces are somewhat loose and disorganized. In fact, right now, we can simply continue with knight c5, attacking the queen on g4. Notice here, if white just goes back to a square like e2, we now have this idea of b5 attacking the bishop. And this bishop on c4 is actually the only defender for the centralized knight. And even if white plays a move like bishop b3, continuing to defend that knight, okay, let's remove the defender and then simply win this piece, this position, and this game is just simply winning for black. So y'all going back to this queen takes g4 move, we have this knight c5 idea, and we're really threatening to play b5 following by the simple winning of that knight once we take that bishop on b3. The best move here for white is actually this move of queen d1 going all the way back 
to its starting spot because against b5 and bishop b3, now white has this idea of knight takes b3 and then defending the knight on d5 with their queen on d1. So in this case, we're not going to capture this bishop, but can simply continue with a move like king h7. And even here, I do think that black is a lot better. White has evened out the material, but we as black have this centralized pawn on e5. A very coordinated game, active pieces all around, and we're actually eyeing this key f5 followed by f4 push on the king side attacking the bishop with a very fun and active hippopotamus defense game. So again, y'all, here after castling king side, white could have taken this pawn on g4, but knight c5 followed by b5 ideas really show that white's position is not all that great when you really analyze it. So here we see this move of f3. White here simply trying to break open the king side of the board and make this king on g8 a target. Here we see a response of b5 followed by knight c5. Again, a key idea. Sure, it works against queen takes g4, but it also just works pretty well in general. Right now we are attacking this bishop on b3 and again threatening to simply win this knight on d5 after doing so. So here we see this move of rook a d1, which is actually the best option in the position because now if a move like knight takes b3, which is what was played in the game, white can capture back and now this knight is defended by that rook on d1. But now we see a position which, okay, what do we do as black? Well, currently white is threatening to simply capture off our pawn on g4. And on top of that, white has potential knight b6 ideas here, attacking our queen, and on top of that, attacking our rook on a8. So why not defend this pawn on g4 and get rid of those knight b6 ideas? Let's just play this move of queen g5, right? Very active, throwing our queen to the action, eyeing some key squares, and defending this pawn. Here white plays the move of knight d2, but I really quickly want to cover why white did not take on c7. This seems to be a good option, but notice here we can now take on f3, and white now has to capture back with either the rook, queen, or pawn. Let's cover each of these. Well, first off, if a move like queen takes f3, we're simply going to play bishop g4, attacking the queen and taking the rook short thereafter. If a move like rook takes f3, we're going to play rook a7. I mean, our rook's attacked, so why not just bring this rook up one square, threaten to just go up a piece, and the moment that that piece runs away to a square like d5, then bring our bishop g4, and yet again, we're going up the exchange here. See how queen takes f3 and rook takes f3 simply do not work here for white because of that bishop g4 idea. Very active game there for black. What about this move of g takes f3? Well, actually, this does technically give white even material, but we now have very great attacking chances starting off with knight f4. In fact, right now, queen f2 and queen e3 simply result in us winning that queen and having a simply crushing game. And here, if a move like queen e1, white has both of the rooks on the first rank, including their queen on e1. And really, the three minor pieces are scattered all around. We can now play a move again, like rook a7, attacking this knight. We got bishop h3 ideas on the way. And I just don't see a future in which white's going to be able to fight for equality here. So y'all going back to this position, Petrosian's opponent was very smart to not capture on c7 because of that g takes f3 idea, but instead plays this move of knight d2. Whole idea being now when we do take on f3, we don't have to take back with a pawn, rook, or queen, but we can instead simply capture back with our knight on d2 and attack that queen on g5 with tempo. And here from Petrosian, we see the extremely aggressive and really best move of f5 five expanding on the king side of the board this does allow white to take on c7 but in that case we see petrosian respond with rook a7 and now following knight d5 white isn't even up material in fact white just evened out the material but really by doing this you can argue that white is being a little bit too greedy or at least a little bit too eager to try to even out the material because now we have bishop e6 attacking this knight yet again and now if a move like knight b4 from white we're going to continue expanding on the king side and we just have an extremely active game with a ton of potential here white really tries to lock things up though with f4 right attacking our queen in which case petrosian responds with queen d8 now forcing a double attack against this knight on d5 so now the knight goes okay i'm just going to run away in which case we now have a very complicated and hard to navigate position for black here. There's a lot of options. How do we continue? Well, guys, one thing that I really tell my students is to always look at the positioning of your pieces and which pieces can become more active or more improved. This queen on d8 is currently under fire to this rook on d1. Not a deadly threat at the moment, but it definitely could be in the future. I mean, right now, white does have potential ideas like knight f3 attacking our queen, followed by putting pressure on that e5 pawn. So what do we do in a situation like this? We here see this move 
of queen c8. Now this move at first sight may seem very passive, or at least, you know, not very confrontational, just kind of moving our queen somewhere where it's not under the line of fire. But guys, if you look at this position, what is a better square that this queen can be on? First off, there's really no way for white to attack this queen in any near future. And this queen on c8 may not be quote unquote active, but it has a ton of potential. I mean, it's currently covering c7, which would defend the pawn on e5. We have queen c6 ideas. We have queen c5 check ideas. We're really just making activity all the way down on the c file. At any point, we could always just throw a queen over on a8. We have a lot of different options here and a lot of flexibility. And in a position like this, where you're trying to read and react what the opponent's going to do, putting a queen on c8 here really does give white a ton of trouble. We see this option here of a3, which really tries to stop the threat of b4, making this knight run away, in which case we would then be attacking the pawn on c2 because of this queen c8 move. And now from black, we see this move of rook e7, aiming the rook towards the opponent's queen. Guys, when I was younger, back in my tournament days, right now I'm 23. Back in the day, you know, I was around 14, 15 years old. My chess coach told me that there's four rules to the opening. And the fourth one, or the fourth step, should I say, was aiming a rook at the opponent's king or queen. I mean, at this point, this rook on e7 isn't making any major threats, but you never know when things are going to break open, and you never know when this rook can come in handy. I mean, a rook on e7 is just much more beneficial for us than a rook on a7, which isn't really doing much except defending this pawn on a6. So here we see from white this move of queen e3, but notice here if a move like f takes e5, white is going up a pawn, but this really frees up the pawn on f5, which is why white didn't go with this option. I mean, right now we could just continue with f4, attacking the bishop if you want to run away again. Okay, let's play f3. I mean, even here, if white takes on f3 two times, they are up two pawns of material, but we now have this idea of bishop c4 and many others. I mean, attacking the queen, obviously when this queen moves, we're attacking the rook, we have queen g4 check ideas, and also winning this knight on f3. And here, if we see a move like queen e4, trying to gain some counterplay, we're actually gonna ask white to take that knight with this idea of rook f4. Whole idea being, if a move like queen takes knight, we have rook g4 with check, we're winning the queen, we're gonna win this rook the very next move, and this game is nearly over. So again, y'all, white was smart to not just see a pawn and go, ooh, I like pawns, let me take it, because of this idea of f4 and f3. We instead see this idea of queen e3, but yet again, I mean, no matter how you chop up this position, black is simply better. We see this move of e takes f4, and after a move like bishop takes f4, we have bishop c4 attacking the queen as well as the rook. So here we see this move of rook takes f4. I'm not even arguing that rook takes f4 is better. I actually think that bishop takes was the better option, but I'm just trying to show that really no matter what white plays here, we're going to win material no matter what. In this situation, we see Petrosian continue with bishop d5 attacking this queen and following queen f2, continuing by capturing off that rook and following bishop takes f4, getting this bishop out of the line of fire. We're simply up the exchange. Why not bring this bishop right back to f7? And here we see white respond with bishop d6 attacking our rook on e7 but in a position like this we got to think in terms of potential counterplay sure we are going to lose a rook but we can't just play a move like rook e1 and try to play normal chess and give our pieces back how can we fight back in a position like this where would we like our rook to be and what potential tactics do we have we see this move of rook d7 and notice that white actually can't even take our rook on f8 because of bishop d4 this rook d7 move very intentional really protecting that move of d4 so that we could simply win the queen so here, y'all, white does not take the rook on f8, but instead continues with this move of knight b3, defending the bishop on d6. And okay, I mean, if we already got some pressure on the bishop, why not put more? We see rook fd8 forming a battery ram, and now the bishop can't even move without us simply winning the rook. So here, white continues with queen g3, trying as hard as they possibly can to hang on to their minor piece. But here we see Petrosian continue with queen c6, and we now have a resignation from white. Very nice hippopotamus game with some very flexible and creative ideas from Petrosian. Again, notice that we have one, two, and three major pieces all attacking that bishop. And the moment that this bishop runs away with a move like bishop f4, we now have rook takes d1 with check, and this position is simply losing for white. So again, following this idea of queen to c6, attacking the bishop on d6, we have ourselves a game over. Thanks for watching today's video. If you'd like to learn the theory behind the hippopotamus defense, click that video to the left. If you'd like to see our entire hippopotamus defense playlist, click that playlist to the right. Leave a comment down below to let me know what other videos you'd like to see covered on this channel. And as always, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.